Hey, what's up folks, how's it going? This is Watch. Hope you guys are all doing well. And today we're gonna to be talking about my ultimate setup for the 16 inch MacBook Pro powered by the M1 Pro chip. Now, if you haven't watched our recent content featuring the 16 inch versus the 14 inch M1 Pro powered MacBook Pros, you definitely have to do so. Check out the description down below to watch that content. But essentially, thanks to the power of the M1 Pro and M1 Max silicon, you can essentially have one computer that does everything no matter what what your needs and demands are. Whether you're gonna be using your laptop for general productivity, office related work, content creation, such as video photo editing, perhaps you're gonna be doing some music and audio production, or even some gaming from time to time. No matter what the scenario you can think of, thanks to the power of the new chips, you pretty much have no limitations. Furthermore, since both the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros have a full size HDMI connection, SD card slot, you typically don't need to get adapters for them unless you're gonna need to get some USB type A connections, which is pretty easy to adapt because you do also have three Thunderbolt 4 connections. Now this setup that you're looking at over here is fairly minimalistic. We basically have the essential things that I need personally to get most of my work done from a day-to-day -day basis, which is primarily video editing, uh, photo editing, a uh, little bit of audio production work, gaming, as well as general productivity and office related tasks. So we only really have a keyboard and mouse setup, a 4K monitor, we have a, a USB USB 3.0 hub to add more USB type A connections since that's still not available on the MacBook itself. Now for audio wise, the built-in speakers on the 16 inch MacBook Pro are fantastic. There's six in total that have force canceling woofers, excellent in terms of a uh, general listening experience with the laptop alone, but in a more desktop like setting, we do want a little bit more dynamic range and power for audio production reasons. So I went with my old audio engine A2 plus wired speakers. There was also a Bluetooth version available as well. And uh, we also hooked it up to our Behringer USB 4x4 audio interface to access things like phantom powered XLR microphones, quarter inch inputs to hook up uh, things like uh, real instruments, guitar, bass, things like that, as well as other microphones. And it's going to serve as an excellent base for our audio and music production stuff that we're going to do on Logic with the laptop. Now, beginning the tour of our setup, let's start with the actual computer itself, and that's the 16.2 inch MacBook Pro. Specifically, we're using the $2,500 base model configuration. So that comes with the M1 Pro chip with a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU. We have 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now the MacBook, based on our testing thus far, actually runs relatively efficiently and fairly cool, even if, if you're taxing it really hard all the time, but it doesn't help to get a stand to get a little bit better airflow and to help preserve the longevity of the components inside. So we're actually going to be using a foldable collapsible laptop stand that's going to help elevate the laptop to get better airflow and to get better access to the ports inside. And it's also going to help reduce the overall footprint of uh, the a laptop on our desktop space since that's going to free up space for more things in the future. So we're actually using a relatively affordable foldable laptop stand, has multiple levels of adjustability, is super portable, and typically you can get these on Amazon for under $20. And it's a great way to maximize your desktop real estate as well as increase the airflow underneath. The uh, stand itself is heavily padded with nice rubberized uh, padding on the surface, so it won't scratch the nice aluminum finish on the, your MacBook. And uh, again, you're gonna access your ports a bit easier angle up the keyboard if that's necessary and uh, this really is a no-brainer if you're going to be using a laptop hooked up to external peripheries and monitors in a desktop like setting now if you want to know the exact model of this stand specifically we're going to have that in the description down below as well as uh, the links of all the products that we're going to be using in this video. Moving right along, since we don't have a USB type A connections on board on the MacBook Pros, as we mentioned earlier, we are gonna need to adapt it. I'm gonna initially use a USB C extension cable and hook it up uh, to my old trusty G Ting USB Type C hub. Been using this thing for all of the previous generation of MacBook Pros. It's a great little hub, it actually comes with a multi card reader as well as a two USB Type A connections, which we're going to be hooking up to one, our Seagate Backup Plus 8 terabyte external hard drive, and the other one's going to go to our TP Link USB 3.0 hub with seven ports as well as two extra ports for 2.4 amp charging. Now, since our mechanical 
identical external drive from Seagate is uh, 7200 RPM and uh, interfacing through a USB 3.0. It's not going to be as fast as the internal SSD drive built into the MacBook, but it's definitely a affordable way to get more storage options into your MacBook since it only costs around $230 for eight terabytes, a great for expanding your storage and getting a localized backup solution. Now, as you can see, I've reverse mounted the seven port USB 3.0 hub. So that's going to free up more space down below so we can easily house our external drive right there and save a lot of space that way. That's going to free up space for more items in the future. And plus with seven ports uh, available on a type A basis, we can easily hook up many different accessories in the future, no problem, including the Behringer USB audio interface that we talked about earlier. Specifically, uh, we're using the UMC 404 HD Four microphone preamps with XLR phantom power as well as a quarter inch inputs as well as four output connections. We're actually hooking up our Audio Engine A2 speakers directly at the back of the unit using the analog left right RCA connections and uh, the bookshelf speakers themselves are powered independently so we don't need a separate amplifier to power the speakers. Now, of course, it's important to mention that the Audio Engine A2 speakers are not studio grade reference monitors designed for serious audio and music production, rather just a uh, speaker system designed for laptops or desktop based experiences, gaming, listening to music generally, and uh, watching movies and things like that, but are just a base upgrade on uh, the built-in speakers on the MacBook Pros. Now, eventually I will be upgrading to some proper studio reference monitors, so uh, the sound quality will be definitely improved for specific music production, but for the time being, general listening experience, these are definitely passable, and there's actually a new version of the A2 Pluses from Audio Engine that have built-in Bluetooth capabilities, so you can wirelessly connect them to the MacBook if you're not going to be using an audio interface. Now moving forward, let's talk about the peripherals we're using, specifically in terms of the keyboard and mouse, which are uh, both from Logitech. The keyboard that we're using is the MX Keys. It's been available for many years now. The keyboard itself has full function keys. It's full size, designed for both Mac OS X and Windows use. You can hook wirelessly via Bluetooth or its included dongle connection, and you can pair up to three devices and seamlessly switch between them. The keycaps themselves are fairly large have a decent amount of travel distance and you can see that there's a spherical indentation to match the shape of your fingertips so it gives a nice comfortable tactile feedback and sensation and is super comfortable to type on while still being relatively low profile at around 20 millimeters in terms of thickness. Now you have a built-in rechargeable lithium-ion battery in here and it does have a backlight system that actually has a proximity hand sensor so it'll actually turn off the backlight when it's not in usage but with the backlight on you typically get a week to 10 days of usage and with it off you can get up to five months of usage. To go with the MX keys, you have to go with the MX master mouse. So we chose uh, the uh, third version, which is a, a relatively current uh, model. And uh, if you're looking for a general mouse uh, that has the uh, dark field technology, which uh, can be used in multiple different surfaces, including glass and is Bluetooth enabled, I don't think really you can go wrong with the MX master three. We've been using it for a couple of years now. It's ultra fast, responsive and diverse enough where you can do a little bit of gaming with it as well as your general computing. On top of that, the MX Master also has a dedicated gesture control button, which allows you to get access uh, to the commands you typically do on the built-in trackpad on the MacBook Pro. So you can switch between uh, desktop spaces, launch mission control, or the launch pad just using the mouse itself, which is pretty cool. Furthermore, the main reason why I went with the Logitech MX series of peripherals, apart from the dedicated Apple ones, is especially considering the Magic Mouse is not that comfortable to use for me personally. I find the ergonomics on the Logitech side are definitely superior. Even though the MX Master 3 doesn't require a mouse pad, you can use it on any desktop surface and get similar performance. But in order to get better overall tracking surface and consistency, I typically do like to use a mouse pad uh, just for comfort reasons. And for many years now, I've been using the Cooler Master MP860, which is actually a dual sided mouse pad with RGB lighting. So on one side, you have a traditional low friction fabric finish, which is designed for a little bit more speedier action based tracking performance, while the aluminum side on the other side is a little bit more tuned for fine precision and control over your movements. 
Now, specifically in terms of the external monitor, we're using the LG 32UD99-W. It's a Thunderbolt enabled in-plane switching monitor with a native resolution of 3840x2160, has HDR10 official certification, and besides hooking it up via Thunderbolt, which you can do on the MacBooks, I'm actually using the HDMI connection since that's going to free up more Thunderbolt connections to hook up to later things uh, down the road. The biggest highlight of this monitor definitely has to be the ultra thin bezels and the low profile. There's still actually not a lot of newer monitors that match the aesthetics of this and it, even though it is a couple of years old, it actually fits very well with the aesthetics of the new generation MacBook Pros. Furthermore, the color reproduction is excellent. It can reproduce the DCI P3 color spectrum up to 95%, has a gray to gray response time of five milliseconds, which isn't great for gaming, but decent enough for most casual gamers out there. And the peak brightness is not bad, up to 550 nits, and the typical brightness is around 350 nits. Furthermore, you can see that I've added some RGB light strips at the back of the monitor, which help make the picture pop out even more and it's fantastic for consuming media and uh, doing all my work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, with the current version of the MacBook Pro that I have right now, you can actually add a, another monitor since it can support dual monitors fairly easily with the M1 Pro configuration. And if you get the M1 Max version of the chip, you can actually support up to four external displays. At the time being, I'm super happy with one and having that Ultra HD resolution definitely adds a lot in terms of screen real estate and having 32 inches is definitely going to be great for, again, maximizing uh, the amount of of desktop space that I have both on the built-in 16 inch display and on the external monitor. So my multitasking capabilities will go up and hopefully my productivity as well. Now, in terms of the desk itself, I'm using just a couple of different bits and bobs that I got from Ikea. You can easily configure any desk uh, from them and have kind of a similar look. It does not have any motors or sit and stand options since primarily this is going to be a sit down chair experience and uh, hopefully we'll expand upon this existing setup in the very near future. But for the meantime, if you have any specific questions, I definitely love to hear your thoughts. Also, please make sure to check out the description down below for all the detailed information about everything we talked about in this video. If you go through any of our Amazon affiliate links, helps make content like this possible, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. So a big thank you to you guys that do so on a regular basis. And uh, if you haven't watched our recent content featuring the 16 inch MacBook Pro, again, definitely check out that content in the description down below. In the meantime, subscribe if you haven't already, share the content, and we'll see you real soon. Take care.